Well, good afternoon, good morning to you. My name is John Rayson. I'm the Head of Consulting Services for Santa Fe Relocation Services and would welcome you today. Thank you for signing up to join us on a very interesting session looking at um, really the future of mo global mobility towards 2020. Um, today, we're going to take a look at currently what the function does, um, what needs to change, and really what the future holds for global mobility. Joining me here today, I have two very seasoned professionals who have worked in many, um, many industries. And first of all, I'm delighted to welcome Selena Jones-May, who's the Group Director, Global Mobility for Wally Parsons. Good afternoon, Selena. Hi, afternoon, John. Would you, would you like to just briefly share um, a little bit about yourself, which it's um, lovely to do that for us? Yes, yeah, certainly. So as you mentioned, I'm currently at Wally Parsons. I've been there for six months. So I'm new to this industry, the um, energy and um, construction industry. Um, I'm also, um, you know, I've worked in different industries before that. So I started my career in PwC in the tax world. Um, I then moved into mobility when I joined PepsiCo to head up the European team there. Um, most recently, I was um, head of global mobility at Lloyd's Register. Um, so I'm really delighted to join this um, debate this afternoon. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And my, our other colleague joining us this afternoon is uh, Andrea, or maybe we'll call you Andy Piacentini, and is the head of reward UK and Europe for Standard Life. And he's also a partner of the RES Forum. Good afternoon, Andy. Good afternoon, John. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. Would you like to share briefly with the with the participants um, a bit more about yourself, please? Yes. So I'm Andrea Piacentini, or Andy. So Andrea's my my Sunday name, um, and I'm currently at Standard Life, and as John says, a founder of the RES Forum, which is an international networking community for in-house mobility practitioners, um, in-house only. And we've been running the RES Forum, me and my colleagues, for 10 years nearly, and we are just a bit short of 1,000 members, um, which is very exciting for us. Um, putting the RES Forum aside, um, I have worked in mobility in expat tax and also laterally more broadly in reward, so incentivization, compensation, all that good stuff. And I'm very excited and very enthusiastic about this subject matter today. I have very strong views on what we're discussing, so looking forward to the presentation. Thank, thank you very much. And in fact, we had a, a colleague this morning where I think, Selena, you would agree that some of the comments were quite similar. I suspect that, that uh, we're in for a, quite a fun afternoon or another hour with, with Andy and he, as you say, has strong views. So, yeah, you never know. Hopefully we won't disappoint. <laughs> exactly. So, so the format really is just to, what we're going to do is to go through a few themes and I'm going to ask you some questions. If anybody from the audience actually has any questions, if you let me know, I can pose them to both Selena, Andy and myself. The, really to kick things off, I mean, just to give you some context to what we see going on in the world of mobility, uh, it seems that really mobility departments are having to do more with less. Selena, is, we hear all the time about this. Is this something that's affecting your business? Yeah, I mean, I'd entirely agree with this statement. I think across mobility I've seen in the last, uh, well, 10, 15 years, I think increasingly be feeling that sort of squeeze. Absolutely. I think mobility professionals are under far more pressure than we were before. I think we need to demonstrate now a true return on investment on our function, and we are under um, really big pressure to deliver commercial solutions. Um, I think it does also depend, though, on the industry sector that you're working in. So in the industry that I work in, the um, engineering and construction industry, it's basically very, you know, impacted by the oil price at the moment. So we in particular as an industry are suffering and therefore the pressure is on all departments, not just mobility. But um, certainly I can feel that squeeze. We need to do things leaner, faster, cheaper, but maintain the standards and the quality of our service. I think in other industry sectors, um, certainly ones I've worked in like the FMCG, um, I've seen that there have been better budgets and 
possibly different drivers there. So I think it does depend on the size of your team um, and also the level of investment that you have in your function. And I think latterly as well, one final point would be how important is global mobility as an agenda item at the top of your company? If it's recognized as a big driver and you really have got that seat at the table, maybe um, it's not so tough. So I think there are many factors, but overall as a statement, I'd agree. Thank you. I mean, just out of interest, is this something that's exclusive to mobility or, for example, your HR peers and even finance and other and other functional services, is it the same pressure on them too? I think in the industry I'm sitting in now, I think it's across all departments, um, but that is quite unique. I think in other um, industries I've worked in before, um, I would use the phrase that um, mobility can sometimes be the bridesmaid and never the bride. You know, we really do have to now fight to to get to the front of that altar and to be right up there because um, if we don't, if we don't, you know, have a voice and really, um, you know, demonstrate um, why we should be there, then, you know, we will all we'll, we'll suffer with the budget cut in and um, the investment that we're looking for. Okay, thanks. So, Andy, what's your view? Is, is mobility under a squeeze? I, I mean, yeah, I think fundamentally mobility and, um, and HR more broadly is, is under a real squeeze. I think, for me, the challenge that HR functions faced uh, was in many ways a consequence of our success, which is, you know, UP, we've got a place at the table, we've got our Yorick model, we've got our business partners, we've got our HR operations, shared services, and the, the case has been made. Um, however, we are not immune to the evolution of technology, of the workplace, of employees, and also, did I say, the evolution of leaders. And, you know, the holy grail, I guess, for an HR function is that your leaders are so competent and skilled uh, that, therefore, you don't need to lean on HR to help guide your thinking, to help enable your people management processes, because either through capable leaders or through more and more effective technology, uh, you can achieve those same outcomes. Now, here's the thing. As technology improves uh, and as more and more complicated processes become automated versus people-driven, you start seeing questions being asked around how you design organisations and what kind of workers you need. Uh, I, I do think historically white-collar workers have been quite arrogant in terms of thinking back to the creation of things like shared services where or call centres but it was very transactional tasks that were outsourced or automated. And now what we're seeing with smarter and smarter technology is actually white collar jobs, professional level jobs, uh, are being subject to scrutiny and questions around whether they can be automated. And what that for me, more broadly with HR, means you know, let's question what we're actually doing and do we need all of these HR people. But then secondly, mobility, and controversially I would say it's always been the poor relation of talent management and reward, suddenly unless you can show your value, unless you can show how you add value in a complicated world, then people are going to increasingly ask, well, do we need mobility professionals? Can we, uh, or is it the case that the skills that reside with mobility professionals uh, become part of the core skill set of your general HR business partner or talent manager? And so, in some ways, the need for the skills and the knowledge doesn't disappear, but how it's structured and where it resides could very well. That'd be my two uh, cents. That, that's fantastic. That's interesting. And I think we're going to have some fun with this um, in a few minutes. So be, so the, what I want to put next is a slide that really is actually from uh, your, your, your survey in 2015. I, I always use it because it seems to me very clear that, that uh, to your point, that if mobility is being squeezed, if the business is looking for you as Selena said to be more commercial. Do you have, number one, do you have all these skill sets within the mobility function? And secondly, how can you, how can you be strategic and operational at the same time? Selena, maybe, maybe I can ask you to look at your model. How are you structured today to deliver on these specialist areas? Yeah, so I was going to say that um, with us, because um, we're, predominantly skills deployment. Um, we are, you know, very much in terms of getting boots on ground. That's our focus. So, of course, we are very strongly set up in the operational side. So I think, you know, those bottom two, whether it be 
um, go in towards um, the due diligence to get the processes compliant or whether it be to actually engage with the business and the assignees, I think we're very strong there. And also I would say top left with strategic advisor, we are, um, because again, the nature of what we do with our project work, we are very much at the coalface with our project teams delivering um, bids and determining whether a project is actually worthwhile pursuing. Um, the piece where um, I think, um, again, it's, it's industry specific, but we don't necessarily have a very, very big um, policy around is the talent management. You know, we do obviously have talent and we manage them in a kind of ad hoc manner. But I have obviously worked at FMCG where, you know, there are very big talent teams and it's very much driven within mobility as well. So that's the piece where I think, you know, there's there's a gap in some departments, rightly or wrongly. In our case, you know, we just don't see at the moment that need per se. But I would say um, there is a question mark over who should do the work. So, you know, I've, I've hotly debated this in the past with other mobility professionals. Should this sit within HR? Should this sit within resourcing? Um, should this sit with mobility because, you know, with the fact that teams are stretched so far already doing all the other three boxes, it is a big ask, particularly if there's no technology to support it. So I, I would say that is a, a bit of a question mark and also it's been kind of a few decades we've debated this talent link, but it hasn't come into fruition in a lot of um, organisations in the way it was expected, which questions, you know, is it is it being formed in the right way? I think that's a good point. Yeah. Andy, what's your view, Andy? Yeah, I mean, I, I, look, I think this is a very interesting um, descriptor of the talent manager, and it's a very interesting model. You know, I worked with Michael Dittman in creating this, and I, I really believe passionately that this is a great way to articulate what based practice mobility practitioners should, should focus on. A um, few things for me. Um, I think historically, um, mobility practitioners have fallen into that bottom left quadrant. So an expert on due diligence, or as we evolve that concept in the race forum, kind of expert on things like taxation, uh, immigration, social security, the technical bits that can make things happen. Uh, and they're operational and they're processes. So this is an area where we've always been strong in our space. It's also an area I would challenge every mobility practitioner to think about because, from my earlier point, if something's a process or if something is operationally complex, could that be the knowledge that becomes systemised or uh, automated? Question mark. So I think we're strong in that quadrant. Um, strategic advisor, what I realise is that so much of the expertise in technical areas can become strategy as well. Uh, in the moment, I'm working on a very senior appointment, um, an, an individual moving from Ireland to the UK, but they want to retain their home contract in Ireland and commute. Uh, and you know, I'm completely leading this, the discussion ahead of my HR business partners, and I'm coordinating um, the taxation guys, and I'm playing effectively the workforce planner role because I, a, I understand the issues, but secondly. Um, because of that understanding of the issues, you have to then start to coordinate. And what that's reminded me is that really good value and mobility expertise does fit into that space very nicely. Um, HR, generally, HR practitioners just don't have that broad knowledge that really good mobility experts do. And somebody like Selena will have that through her tax background. She'll be able to know what the red flags are and begin to coordinate and ask all the right questions. And that's so, taking this up a level, that's really where we can add value. Uh, now, the paradox to that is if you don't have that knowledge, where are you adding value? Um, the, the secondary point around that last example I described was on people effectiveness, and I think that's where we can help be workforce planners and we can help the organisations think not just to immediate deployment, but what happens next, you know? Is a secondment the right basis? Duration of a secondment? Is it a permanent move? What's your next two talent moves for this talent that you're investing in? We can play a real role in that. However, if we don't, and if we don't ask those questions, then again, we drop back into the bottom left box, the expert due diligence and compliance. And as I said, that to me is the area that's most at risk from automation, from, from and, and effectively most at risk of, of, of disappearing from our role content. Uh, Celine makes a very interesting point about the global talent manager. Uh, again, for me, 
good to know how we tie into the talent function. It's certainly, mobility is a lever of talent management, but it's not talent management per se. So, what I find it quite amusing is when I hear companies, and I won't name them, but let's just say external third party companies that talk about talent management and, and talent mobility. To me, that's the most made up phrase I've ever heard talent mobility. It's just talent management. Mobility is a lever of that. Mobility isn't talent management per se. So it brings into question whether what that really means, the global talent manager. And I think the answer to that is just fitting into the talent function, telling, fitting into the talent strategy and understanding where you fit into that space. It's not about replacing the talent function. That's a, a quite interesting view. So what I'm going to look at next is, 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 a, is a, from, our, from the Global Mobility Survey that we uh, commissioned through Circle Research. And I'm in the middle of looking at the results for 2016. And a world exclusive, it, it's the, those stats are probably not going to change much. You know, let me ask a question to both of you. Maybe I'll ask Selena first. You know, if, if, if there's a squeeze on mobility, there's a need to be more business partnering, more strategic. Why is it people still feel the need to have to manage themselves immigration compliance and tax compliance? I mean, so long as it's being done, does it matter who does it? Selena. I would say, um, personally speaking, that um, I would never want to fully let go of anything um, of that nature. So really, if you think about the true value of a mobility professional, as um, Andy's alluded to, it's the technical know-how. And at the end of the day, we're risk managers, you know, almost like insurance brokers. We're the ones who are actually ensuring that the company doesn't get into trouble. So personally speaking, you know, when we look at those items in red lines, I would say, you know, we should be really challenging ourselves. What can we outsource which has low risk associated with it? So, you know, ordinarily it could be some simple payroll activities, some of the assignment management maybe. Um, but then some of the other aspects, although we all have vendors that we use to do the tax returns, for example, and the visas, I would never fully let go of having the overall control and management of that because ultimately that's if it goes wrong, that's what's going to end up getting the company into trouble and you know, reputational damage and penalties, etc. So I really think we need to keep within, within the company those items which have the highest risk, and that's what we're being paid to do, ultimately, as well as look at all the other strategic stuff. Uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with anything you said. I guess the question is, is should you be supplier managing that or should you do it internally? You know, you've heard me say before, that, you know, when was the last time you rang up payroll to thank you for being paid? And whilst, yeah. it, whilst it needs to be delivered, it doesn't necessarily mean you physically need to do things yourself. But I absolutely... Exactly. But, yeah. but, uh, and, and Andy, you know, you, you have a professional service background too. I'm sure you, you are very risk averse in the way you operate your programme. Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Right. And just in general, working in financial services at the moment, um, Conduct and risk is so, so high on the agenda. Um, it's that balance so between what's um, robust risk management and what's actually just holding things back and what's allowing the business to be nimble. And it's quantifying what risk is. For example, a trap that I think mobility professionals fall into is they become complete blockers, they become the mobility police, uh, and they don't support any policy variation because of the risk attached with having variation uh, and that often goes directly against engaging talent in the right way and with risk I think you always have to think about another aspect which is probability you know so all very well risk managing but what's the chances of this terrible thing happening what's the chances of this one person getting an extra you know I don't know extra benefit the chance that you have to offer it to the other 900 employees in your program. Now, it may be high because it may be a visible benefit, but it may be very low. And so, although I'm very, very conscious about risk, my concern is always that it begins to inform broader behaviours and actually becomes counterintuitive to the business and how they manage programmes. And that's interesting. And it's something I, I hadn't raised this morning when we had another one of these sessions. But increasingly, we're seeing business travellers being moved out of being managed by departments and actually being loaded onto the shoulders of mobility functions. 
Selena, is that something that's happening in your world? At the moment, um, not into mobility. It's more being handled on a local um, HR uh, basis, although, you know, we obviously do get engaged where people trigger a particular liability and we need to maybe put them on a commuter arrangement. But it is an interesting point of debate. So I was at an event about three months ago and people were talking about this being the hot potato. And I think the key issue is that nobody really wants to own it. So you've got travel teams owning it, you've got HR, you've got finance, tax, mobility, nobody. Um, and everyone's trying to push it around. And really, I think the consensus in the group that I was um, discussing it with is, is that really we need to have a organizational wide position on it. Because if you can't agree who owns it, you can't even get a budget agreed to track it and manage it. So I think it is um, a very challenging um, concept. Andy, and a very risky one. And, yes. Yeah. I'll, please, sorry, Silly, I cut, I cut you off. Please carry on. Please finish. Sorry. No, no, I was, I was done. That's all right. Okay, Andy, what's your view? I mean, you let maybe take it from your from the Res Forum perspective. What are you seeing? What are your customers telling you? What are your colleagues telling you? Sorry, I'm not here, John. I'm sorry. I'm saying from a from a Res Forum perspective, um, what's the view on business travellers? Is 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 this something that's becoming an issue in that they've got to manage it and they're being mobility is being staked as the, the people to manage it? Well, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Um, it's a real. I mean, it's it's the it's the one area that you'll fall very foul of a heap of compliance issues, um, both at a corporate organisational level and an individual level. Um, I think, uh, to be honest, where we are currently, I mean, it was before at Howden, um, it was senior guys that they supported it for, and because of the seniority, they were very keen just to make it happen in whatever way we could. Um, so I suspect it's a kind of talent-driven conversation in many ways. The more crucial you are and the more highly rated you are, the more likely you're, you're going to get support for a complex cross-border business travel commuter arrangement. Um, I think as well, often, by the time the, impl the impact of it is fully understood, often the agreements are already underway um, or commitments have been made that it can be supported uh, and it's almost too late to then undo those conversations and the business may decide just to live with some of the pain that's attached to it. But I think increasingly with mobile technology, uh, with, with remote working, this is the direction of travel has to be. Um, my only question, my only concern is when will the authorities keep up with it? Um, you know, being based in Scotland, um, we can see people commuting down from Edinburgh to London uh, and there's no, notwithstanding the kind of tax reliefs on the business travel, there's no other issues. However, that same scenario I described, somebody moving from Dublin to the UK on a similar basis is just storing up a whole heap of problems. Uh, and I think this is our biggest challenge as the regulators keeping up with modern work practices. The cynic in me thinks they may not want to because the more complex it is, the more likely they are to make money for compliance failures. That is a very cynical view. I, I, I wouldn't disagree. So I'm going to take this... Uh, take us into now into more of these sort of systems and technology space because one of one of the big debates this morning was around the use of big data. I mean, everybody's using the word big data, and what still astonishes me that we're we're in the year 2016. Man went to the moon in 1969, and we're using Excel spreadsheets to run our programs. Um, why is it, Andy? First of all, with you, you think that companies are challenged? to provide meaningful data into their businesses? Did you hear me okay? Are you there? Um, okay, let me ask Selena if that, ask that, ask that question of you. So um, what you're saying is why they are being challenged to, okay, yes. Um, so really at the end of the day, you know, mobility, you know, we have the hugest costs sitting under our belt if you think about it. If you think an expat is, whether it be three times or five times the cost of a local, even though we're starting to pare down those costs over time, I mean, it's a huge, you know, human capital cost. And yet, you know, historically, nobody's actually been totting up how much this is costing. 
So therefore, you know, quite rightly, I think the business are looking at this and saying, well, you know, demonstrate that cost. So um, it does surprise me there's there's such a large number of people that aren't using technologies, but in a way, um, having discussed this in forums before, I think a ma massive blocker is actually getting the investment to put a technology in. And when um, I've discussed this in the past, you know, my counsel would be, you know, make sure you get that business case really robust. And, you know, in the cost of perhaps two assignments, you can buy that technology for a year. But, I mean, if we can't actually articulate how much an assignment costs or how much our program costs, then really we can't then expect to be at the table um, asking for investment for mobility and being taken seriously. Absolutely. And I'd, I'd be very interested to hear from the people, the attendees on the call, whether they actually can track their costs, because it, it, I'm amazed when I go around the world how many companies still struggle to understand the total cost of their program. Um, how, yes. how do you think, think and how do you think that creates value? And is this something that businesses are really looking for more, more data? What sort of things are you are you asked for from your business? At the moment, I mean, because we're very heavily involved in bids, I mean, we can get given only a day's notice, say, and we've got to do like 100 projections, you know, for a massive big project in some random remote location. So we have to, you know, use our technology to scramble and give those numbers. Um, so if we got those numbers wrong, it would um, impact the entire profitability of that project and we have um, audits that go on throughout projects and and as part of those reviews if the costs projected by mobility ends up being out in the end then there's follow-up with our team and we have to work with the project team to work out what went wrong so really you know we have our next line when we're projecting those costs so it's in our interest as much as the business overall to make sure those numbers are as accurate as possible I, I can see that will be a challenge, particularly in the in the yeah. in now. So looking at the bigger picture, I'm not sure whether we still have Andy on the line or whether he's dropped out from the call. Um, looking at the bigger picture, what do you think, looking forward another five years, how do you think technology is really going to impact mobility? So, so I'm Andy here. Oh, he's there. Good. Oh. <laughs> Hi. oh, thank goodness for that, Andy. We, th we thought you dropped off. Well, I had to. I, my, I'm on a laptop, and my charger started flashing up. So, if you were asking a question two minutes ago, I had to run to my desk to get the charger. So, okay. Apologies, but I've been back. So, did you get the question, by the way? <laughs> so, the question was around how will technology impact mobility in the next five years? Yes. So, here's what's going to happen. Here's my prediction. What I'm seeing as a, an interested spectator, John, is um, the movement into the market of disruptors. Um, in terms of companies like yourself, real companies, assignment management companies, technology-led companies that do your bits, um, and therefore, so dare I say, companies like Move Guides, but equally, I look at the alliances that these companies are forming and how they're trying to kind of take over the whole kind of solution, if you like, start to end. Um, Equus also does similar stuff where if they don't have the expertise, they, they build strategic alliances, uh, and so therefore, I think technology will be very important in the next five years. Um, I, I think it will begin to kind of gobble up how the market supports mobility programs. And I think if you're a third-party provider, if you've not got a really top-end technology solution uh, or a way to incorporate somebody else's into your program, then you'll be left behind. Um, in terms of in-house programs, we're moving into a, a new phase of employee data which is above and beyond just kind of reporting or advanced reporting. We're actually looking at analytics now and predictive analytics, and that's in HR data. So if you can imagine the idea that um, you go into Amazon and you look at some books that you might want to buy, and then the next day you get an email through to say you were looking at books and such and such a subject. Have you thought about these? I can see that moving into the HR space more generally, e.g. flexible benefits. You picked dental care and medical insurance, other people that picked those picked, I don't know, childcare vouchers, um, that kind of thing. Now, how that ties into the mobility space, again, if mobility practitioners within themselves don't keep up with these trains, it will be taken out of their hands, and the company, the organisations will demand that data and the programme management is managed in similar ways. Um, and so therefore, I, th I think that's going to be the trend. Data is going to become much tighter. 
it's going to be used for other purposes, and it's going to be used to not just report, but uh, predict outcomes and predict um, trends within assignment management. And that could also be things like, you know, based on different data that you've submitted in the system, performance ratings, etc., age, profile, demographic, we may be able to predict after your assignment if you'll leave or if you'll stay within the company. Um, it's that kind of thing that I think will be the, the, the next kind of frontier, if you like, in mobility management. So it's much more of a holistic approach to managing programs. I mean, Selena, we cut you off then. Did you want to add anything on that point? Um, I would, you know, agree with everything Andy said. I think the power of the data will be um, incredible. It will actually probably give us a lot more power in terms of our business cases, you know, where we go on about certain um, points of view and often I think we've all been there to struggle to get data out of our own systems even to demonstrate a business case we know is screaming for action. So I mean I would definitely welcome you know an all singing all dancing system that would provide all the analytics and all the data. One thing for me which I think would be incredibly powerful is a system that would you know really you know be able to analyze you know the um, estimate versus the reality of the spend. I know there are technologies out there that do that, but you know something that would even be taking it a few steps further would be, you know, fantastic. So yeah, I think that will be really critical. But I also see probably a bit of a divergence across different companies, depending on the industry they're in. Um, some companies will really, you know, embrace this technology, you know, development. Some will actually perhaps be a little bit fearful of it. And I think in certainly some sectors, like um, I was dealing with some of the media companies and and speaking to them recently, and they said they really believe in a high touch experience. You know, it's very much around the people engagement. So you know, weighing that up against how technology could replace quite a lot of that, um, you know, I guess they would need to work out what's um, the right fit for them. So it will be an interesting journey to see how it all evolves. I, I think it will be, and I think there will be people on, on the call here today who are in different industries saying, well, yes, we can do it, and no, we can't. And I think to some extent, the industry sector, that, as you said at the beginning, that you're in, has different levels of awareness of what could be done from a technological perspective and also a different appetite for looking at data to drive their business differently. To that, to that point, I'm now going to move us forward to something quite interesting. Um, for the first time this year in um, the Global Mobility Survey that we run, we thought we'd do something quite interesting and talk to chief executives. And we had, uh, this year, we had the views of 58 leaders uh, on their views on mobility against the same questions um, that were asked of the mobility people in the survey. The main survey will be out the end of May, but I just thought I'd give you a flavour. And, and the good news for, for HR and mobility is that overwhelmingly, 95% reported that they have to have an internationally mobile workforce to grow their business. And, and I think if you look at some of these stagnating economies around the world, clearly, you know, places like Chile and places in Africa and the ASEAN markets in Southeast Asia are, are really where organizations have to be. They also said that 90% said that it is critical to have in the international assignment experience to create leaders. Um, 83%, and I thought this was quite interesting, given the fact that we often hear that up to 50% of people leave within two years of coming back. Uh, overwhelmingly, they said, actually, you know what, to be a senior leader now, you have to have had international experience. So I'd be really interested to sort of get your reactions, first of all, Andy, to those stats. And, and what does that mean? Is this, is this an opportunity? Is this, is this the point of, you know, no return for mobility? Well, I think a few things, and it actually comes down to, you know, surveys are great, and obviously with the forum that I'm involved with, we do a lot of surveying, but sometimes the risk is that you target companies that have quite well-developed mobility programs, and therefore, on the basis that there are well-developed mobility programs, you get a very a slightly narrower view of mobility within those organisations. What I do think is that I can understand why in companies where mobility is valued and is strategic, then that would be the case. Um, I wouldn't disagree with it. 
And I've heard of this, you know, the whole kind of HSBC model where you need two ex-pass assignments before you can become a senior manager uh, and sign posted at your, as you join the company because you will be mobile in the next three years. Um, I compare it to other companies who are successful domestically um, and they don't need, either they have small international operations or not at all. And really the reality is they, whilst they see mobility as something that may have to happen to get the job done in an obscure location, it's not necessarily going to be a lever to you becoming the chief executive. Um, in fact, it's actually quite a risky enterprise sometimes where you might go and be forgotten. Um, looking beyond mobility though, and I'm a firm believer in this, rather than just focusing on this word mobility, I think we have to just focus more broadly on the term assignment, and that could be in a domestic context, an assignment from finance to marketing, or marketing to HR, and so on. And in fact, I strongly believe that any sort of broadening assignment, be it internationally, and within the same specialism, be it internationally within a different specialism, or be it domestically within a different specialism, will add greater perspective and value to your career. You can only benefit from it. So, in a, quite a long way to be of answering the question, but I do recognise the value of taking different perspectives and different assignments. I just don't know whether global mobility is right for everyone and right for every organisation. And I think it's how you define it, and, and that's why we've been careful to talk about an internationally mobile workforce, because I think increasingly we're also seeing, and Selena, may, maybe you'll comment in a second, that the, the, you know, the, the traditional long-term assignment is slowing down, there are much more, uh, much more activity around one-way transfers, and I think the whole definition of, of mo mobility is changing, and therefore it's actually how do you create value for your business by giving them data and support that, that demonstrates that you're their partner, not you're their administrator. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I think, you know, Andy's um, points are all really valid, but I'd also add, yeah, it's about having a global mindset ultimately. And, you know, there are some groups of people who don't have the opportunity for the assignment or are not mobile, but, you know, some people do significant business trips, um, some people work in global teams, um, and I think really companies, you know, need to continue to focus on those areas, those areas too, to have that true um, global feel to the company. Um, I think, you know, it is an interesting statistic that you provided there. I, I'm with Andy on this one that probably, in my experience, I've seen it 50-50. You know, some companies do exceptionally well and mobility is very much ingrained in their leadership development, their talent development, etc. And with that, it's very successful. Um, but in other companies or industries, it is about getting the person to the job as quickly as possible um, and, and, you know, as cheaply as possible sometimes as well. And, um, you know, the person's future career path um, is understood not to really be clear at all or maybe even guaranteed. So um, I think it does really depend on, on what you're dealing with and, you know, the company's philosophy around, around um, mobility per se. And I think all those things are valid. And I think we all know people who've been on assignment or are localised and decide that the organisation they started with isn't the one they're going to continue with. Let me, let me move on to another, to the next slide um, from the survey. It's just, there we go. So, so the, this is nothing particularly uh, new for, for, for those of you on, on, on the call, but what I would say is what struck me the most was how much the C-level, C-suite uh, respondents were very much more focused on the commercial drivers. Now, we said a few minutes ago that if that companies aren't able to track costs, they're not having those commercial discussions. I mean, is this the reason why there's a gap, Andy? Um, yes, possibly. I mean, I think it, it's hard. It's hard because it's, it's at what point you're involved in the discussion and whether you artificially impose yourself in it. Um, in many ways, you've got to earn your, your invite to the table. You can't just demand it. And you've got to show value add. And in some ways, how do you get that route to the table and how do you get that influence in conversation? Uh, my rule of thumb is always you, need, you, you, need, you probably need quite a good compliance failure to first of all justify 
mobility often, mobility is role to play with an HR function, because people suddenly realise, ah, if it had gone through this guy, we could have avoided that problem. Um, once you've got the seat at that table, then you can influence those discussions. But um, but I think primarily, for me, the, the challenge is often, did I say, the individuals, the practitioners themselves, are they truly strategically minded HR professionals? Uh, I increasingly speak to kind of senior people, and, and I'm reassured by the language used in terms of people talking about the broader HR function, um, engagement, talent management, reward management. Um, and it's that whole idea that mobility, it can't afford to be an island with an HR function. It has to be an integrated part of it. And if it is, then its role and its value add is far greater. If it just remains an island, then it will only ever be transactional in my mind. And that's the challenge. Uh, that, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. Selena, what's your view? I mean, I know that you shared with me that since you've been where you, where you where Wally Parsons, that you are focusing much more on the commercial um, delivery within the team. Is is that a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely, John. So I think, you know, again, down to the industry, but um, yeah, we're not much more in mobility focused on the commercial. So I've never worked so heavily directly with the business, um, you know, interacting with the project teams, the finance, um, you know, all of the other stakeholders who ordinarily, perhaps out of this industry, we would be going through, you know, other layers for. So I think the key thing is, you know, absolutely, we do want to be more commercial, but, you know, if we were looking generically across the industry, not just at the one I'm in, I think it's about taking some layers out somewhere, because at the moment we are sometimes ring-fenced, you know, with Gen HR generalists and we've got HR business partners and we're talking through multiple um, groups of stakeholders before the business are contacted and there's you know messages lost in translation we're not able to articulate things you know in the way we want to so I think you know as much as possible we can try and break down some of those barriers and become the mobility business partner in our own right a bit like what Andy said with that executive move he's working on currently, I think that's where we can build our true credibility, um, show our true worth, and then be at the table in our own right um, in the future. Thank you. Um, moving forward again, um, something else that came out, which I thought was interesting. So I, I must admit, when I saw the results from the leader survey, it was it, it, I could feel the love coming from the from the executive team towards mobility. And they're saying here that, you know, they really do feel that the, in the current role they're doing, they're actually doing a very effective job. I think the big standout statistic for me, however, is the fact uh, that 60% of them felt that the role, you know, what they're doing today is great, but it really needs to evolve uh, to the point Andy was making, and you've been making, Selena, that it needs to be much more strategically aligned to the commercial objectives of the organization. Any reflecting on that, Celia, what, what, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with the feedback they've given. Um, my, you know, I think, you know, all these things on the right quadrant are really, really vital. I would question whether some of them should ultimately sit with mobility, as I mentioned before, some of this stuff like the strategic workforce planning, for example. So I think there has to be a robust discussion with the business about, you know, what exactly are they needing in line with their objectives, and then work out who's best placed to fulfill those roles. Um, and then what concerns me as well is if we're going to be expected to do everything in that final box, we still have to maintain all the vital stuff in the middle box and we don't have any additional resource or funding, there's a real problem there. So I think, you know, there has to be a robust dialogue about you're asking us to do a lot more with, you know, the same, the same resources and therefore brings that whole debate we've just had about what can we push out further. Um, in order to be able to take on board that new role. So I think, you know, it's not, not a very easy um, change management exercise. It's going to have to be dovetailed to the company and, and, you know, the way that they want to operate. Thank you. Um, so for the, for the people, for the attendees, we're getting, we're getting to the point soon where it's your chance to start asking the panel questions. I'm going to ask Andy to give his response to this but we're going to open it up very soon to questions. And this morning we had some really interesting questions coming through. So looking forward to get some feedback. So if you want to type, type some questions and I'll put them to the panel. So Andy, just before we move to that, that place, 
What's your view about the future of global mobility? Is it rosy or, or, or not? Well, I think it can go one of two ways for me. As I said at the start, the requirement for mobility knowledge isn't going away, but it may well end up bedded into somewhere else in the organisation, be it, who knows, tax, be it um, reward, be it talent management, or be it the HR professional. I could see that arising with the really operational elements just carved out, dropped into the shared services or outsourced environment. Um, and all those strategic partnering conversations happening with, the, with those other areas. That's um, on the other hand, if, if the mobility practitioners continue to show strategic value, then evidently there will be a need for a, a company may identify them to have dedicated professionals operating in that space. Um, but I think more than ever we're at a crucial point where it's kind of, did I say, evolve or die. Um, and what we as the mobility practitioner community cannot afford is to sit back and just wait for things to happen. We need to keep evolving, we need to keep showing how we add value, because I'll tell you right now, if we don't, we will disappear. It's interesting because um, one of our customers was sharing how they're creating value, and um, they have had very disparate systems, and what they've finally done is to pull together data from, from those different systems, and they're now giving a, an executive power pack monthly to their board around all the things that you were talking about, which is cost, the original business drivers, the talent ratings, the performance ratings. And on the back of that, they have found that they're now being invited to those monthly executive meetings that they weren't before. So, mate, is, is Selena, is, is, that, is that the answer? Is it, is it around providing data and speaking the language of the business? I would say so. We need to step out of talking in all our acronyms and you know, get get ourselves in the mindset of the business. Think about how finance interact, for example, and you know, how you would present something to them. And I really need to get the bare bones of what the key messages are, get the numbers really crisp and clear and be able to articulate them clearly and also defend them if you're challenged. And I think, you know, if you can talk in that manner, then, you know, people will open the door and think, well, actually, yeah, you know, we can have a really valuable discussion here. So I think it's about building that credibility and having that data up your sleeve that will really support it. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to open up the um, discussion to the attendees today. So if you have questions, by all means, please, um, we look forward to receiving them. Just waiting here to see. Andy, any other observations while we're waiting for some questions to come in? Can you hear me, Andy? Yes, yeah, so that was muted there. <laughs> I'm only, I'm only final doom and gloom point. Um, you know, I feel like I'm sitting here with a grim reaper. Outfit one is, um, you know, th this doesn't just apply to, to mobility, in my opinion. It's HR as a whole, um, and I made that point at the start, and I'll continue to make it that we have to continually evolve and look outwards um, at HR practice, but also how the other functions are working, like Selena says, finance. I mean, they, they've got some really amazing and easily accessible metrics and how they add value, and it's harder for us, but it's not possible. Um, so that would be my, my, my secondary observation, which is this applies to all enabling and supporting functions if you like. Okay, question for you, um, Selena. If you move, if not that you are moving, but if you ever move to a new organisation and you had a blank piece of paper, what would be your decision making process about your structure? Well, I think um, I would, you know, really go into the company and first of all um, engage with all the key stakeholders you know to get their feedback on how the current infrastructure is working for them um, and that would include not just um, the leaders but you know HR and other sort of stakeholders we interact with including the mobility team um, I would take time to reflect how the um, function currently operates to so do like a bit of a SWOT analysis um, I would always say don't rush to make radical changes. It's more haste, less speed. 
um, my goal would be to implement the right model for the benefit of the business. So looking at the external market, um, the specific industry that you're in, um, to see what that best practice looks like, and then compile a business case for approval by the stakeholders for the best fit solution. Um, I would say, you know, every single company I've gone to, I'm sure Andy's the same, um, the solution, you know, is, is always going to be different. And if we were to just pick out a model and, and sort of whack it into another company, it would, it would just wouldn't work, it would backfire. So it needs to be very well tailored, I'd say, to the company you're in, the structure, the size of the team, and many other drivers. Thank you. Now, we haven't, we've, I've got a very polite audience here um, this afternoon. We had lots of questions this morning. We're still, we've still got some time. Um, whilst we've got an hour booked for this, clearly if we finish early, then, then we do. But uh, while you've got Selena and, and Andy and myself available to you, we'd love to hear from you. Um, while we're doing that, um, we're just going to move forward to some, another observ maybe some other observations. So um, here are some thoughts that are coming were coming out of the of the leader survey. That um, perhaps Andy and Selena, to your point, that whilst maybe long term assignments are still going to be around, it's much more about identifying those people with potential to become future leaders for maybe for those long term assignments. And I think that there's going to be increasingly a less uh, emphasis on expatriates and probably more on focusing on lots of local to local moves and probably as many uh, one-way transfers as, as you're going to have traditional signees. Um, and I think that demographically, I mean, at the moment, there's around about 20%, 21% of the mobility population are female. Um, and I don't know what your view, Andy and Selena, is, but I suspect that that will grow and the actual demographics and diversity will play a more significant role in the future. Any comments on that, Andy? Are you on mute? Selena? Oh, yeah, good. Sorry, I'm here. Oh. <laughs> you can remember doing that. Yeah. I mean, I think this is an amazing segue into something you asked me to share, which was some um, insights into the next race forum report which is coming out next month and one of our key themes is diversity and the expat program as it relates to female assignees now a few things um, and i won't spoil it um, but in essence what we're finding is that females who return from expat assignment are less likely to have as positive career impact as males that's the first thing Secondly, females are less likely to go to the sort of harder, more riskier locations. And there may be very good reasons for that, if you think about some historical challenges and some local cultural challenges you might face. However, my conclusion of all of that is, is relating to risk and reward. And it's almost the, the, risk, the, the greater risks you're able to take, the stronger the rewards are. So it doesn't really answer your question about female expats. I think a proportionate point is a rel relevant question, but I think more appropriate is are female expats as successful as men? Uh, and for me, the answer is they're not, based on our research, but they could be. Thank you. Selena, have you, that's probably given you time to think. So just broadly, in terms of what you've said there, I mean, I can see there's going to be an increasing number of local to locals. I can get that. I think also that what I'm seeing is a lot more complexity of situations. So we have many more kind of split families now and you know particularly where we work you know rotators and stuff so um, although you know this local to local transfer you know is a great solution I think you know it seems that it's not always going to be possible um, to actually deliver that and I think in terms of diversity I totally agree it seems I mean obviously in that industry it's very male dominated anyway but does seem that um, we need to do more to incentivize or in encourage women to go particularly to these more emerging markets and challenging locations so I think you know companies probably are more focused on that as part of their overall diversity initiatives it'll be great to see more developments there I think also it's nice to see that we've got more changes in terms of it not being the west to east you know moves now in terms of you know develop developing um, 
developed, sorry, uh, signees go into developing locations, it's kind of more of a mixed bag, so with that brings more complexity, but um, I think another challenge will be people who um, have, you know, left their home country, assigned abroad, and then they come back as a local to somewhere like India or China, and then, you know, they don't really fit into local terms um, naturally anymore, and we're seeing a bit of that as well where we are. So that also presents challenges. So I think you know the diversity of mobility per se is going to be increasing rather than um, becoming simpler in the future. Thank you. And it's interesting just to finish on some reflections. I think it was uh, Paul, Pol Paul Polman of Unilever was talking about women in the workplace and, and global diversity. And I think uh, McKinsey were doing some work around this and was saying probably there's billions, if not trillions, of revenue by actually encouraging greater diversity and bringing the female population more, more at the forefront um, into business. And I think some of those boundaries have to change as, as, as mobility in the world changes. Um, last but not least, I just wanted to say to both of you and also to those of you on the call on this uh, webinar today, thank you very much for, for, for joining us. We hope that you found this interesting. Thank you, Selena and Andy, for sharing your views. Just to give you um, some sort of what's going to happen next, um, we have, as Andy was talking about, the Res Forum survey will be out soon. Um, we are almost finalising now the Global Mobility Survey in, in uh, report in conjunction with Circle Research, and that will be out in this summer, probably um, in June. And if you want to have uh, this webinar, the recording of it will be on our website. When you can go to our website, Santa Fe Relocation Services website, and download it. And there is also a supporting white paper that reflects some of the themes that we've discussed already. So on behalf of Santa Fe Relocation Services, I would love, just like to say thank you ever so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Selena.